If you have a copy of God's Word with you this morning, could you turn with me please to Mark's Gospel and the chapter 4 for our reading this morning. Mark's Gospel and the chapter 4. Mark's Gospel, chapter 4, and just for the sake of time, we're just going to read the last few verses, starting at verse number 35. Mark's Gospel, chapter 4, commencing to read at verse 35. And the same day, when the even was come, he that is the Lord Jesus said unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship, and there were with him also there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow, and they wake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? They feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Before we come to the reading of God's word, can we please just seek his face in prayer for just a moment. Our Heavenly Father, we come into thy presence again this morning. We thank thee, our Father, for all the help that you've given in our meeting already. Lord, now as we come to the preaching forth of thy word, we ask our Father that you'll be mouth platter and wisdom to the speaker. Take these stammering and stuttering words, apply them by thy spirit to those that are gathered in our meeting tonight. Or this morning we look to thee for help. Answer our prayer. We ask these things in the Savior's name. Amen. The story is told of a king who offered a prize to the artist that could best depict for him a picture of peace. And he sent an invitation out throughout the country that whatever artist was able to paint this painting, they would bring it to his palace for his inspection, and if it met his approval, it would then be hung in the great throne room. But as the months passed by, the king was disappointed because every painting that arrived in his kingdom was not up to scratch. And so he decided the only way to solve this problem was to organize a competition and to invite all the artists from the country to come into his palace on a given day and to show all their paintings and one of those would then hopefully be selected and used in his palace. The day came. All the artists arrived nice and early. They set up all their paintings. And as the day passed by, the king took his time to walk down through every painting, but he rejected each and every one. The day was drawing to a close and many thought it would be a disappointing day for the king but towards the end of the day he'd managed to find two paintings and they were set in his throne room for a final inspection. The first painting was of a calm lake. The lake was a perfect mirror for those peaceful towering mountains all around it and the blue sky with fluffy white clouds and everyone who viewed this painting agreed the king had made a wise choice. This indeed was a perfect painting showing peace. But the second painting that the king had chosen caused some a bit of confusion because this too was a picture of a lake but instead the mountains were ragged and bare. There was an angry sky from which lightning fell. Down the side of this mountain there was an angry waterfall tumbling down. To anyone who looked at this painting, there was no sign of peace whatsoever. But on closer inspection, the king had noticed that behind the waterfall there was a tiny bush growing in the crack of the rock, and in the bush the mother bird had built her nest, and there she was in the midst of all this tumult and roaring. There she was sitting on her nest in perfect peace. Which painting won the prize? Everyone was keen to know. And after a few moments' decision, the king announced his decision. The second painting would win. And they questioned him, Why, your majesty, why did you choose the second painting? And he replied with this, Because, he said, Peace does not mean to be in a place where there is no noise, trouble, or hard work. Peace means to be in the midst of all of these things and still to be calm in your heart. You see, finding peace in the midst of a raging storm is something that people long to have. 
Too often when the storms are raging, whether they're physical or spiritual, peace is the very last thing that is on our minds. We are so focused and naturally so on the storm that we are in, how we're going to survive, what will happen next, and so often we fail to give any thought or consideration to the one in control of it all. The account that we read together this morning in Mark's Gospel gives us an account of a storm and the disciples were right in the middle of it. In chapter 4 and verse 35, we discover that the Lord Jesus has spent the majority of the day preaching to the multitudes that had gathered round him and to the disciples as well and has come towards evening time and he's longing for a period of rest and so he gives a very simple instruction to his disciples in the verse 35, let us pass over onto the other side. I'm sure the disciples were delighted to hear this from the Savior. They were welcoming this command, this time where they could relax and recuperate from the exertions of the day and be ready for the following day. Now, the Sea of Galilee was a a familiar stretch of water to most, if not all, of the disciples, for remember that most of them had been fishermen before they came and followed the Savior. And so they would have spent endless hours on the Sea of Galilee getting their livelihood. And as they made their way across the Sea of Galilee, it's interesting to note this, and we'll come back to it later in the verse 36, that as they made their journey, there were also with him other little ships. It seems that there were other people who had followed the command of the Savior and wanted to follow him, either to hear more teaching or to see what would be happening the following day. Their journey seemed uneventful. The sea was calm and peaceful. And I'm sure the disciples took the opportunity as they made their way across the sea that evening to recall the events that had taken place. I'm sure they reflected on the man that had been healed with the withered hand. They looked back on all those people that had been sick, the blind, the lame, the maim, whatever the Savior had touched and made whole. And I'm sure they also discussed the reaction of the crowd to the Savior. Those that listened, those that didn't. And I have no doubt that the disciples were just like you and me, and in a crowd that size, they were discussing who was there and who wasn't. Did you see so-and-so was there? Did you see? Did, you won't believe this, but so-and-so never showed. And I'm sure they were discussing this on their way over, but regardless of the discussion, we find that their talk doesn't involve the Savior. The events of this past day have taken their toll on him, and so we find that he's found in the verse 38 asleep on a pillow. Unknown to these disciples, they were about to face a storm the like they had never, ever seen before. And this journey that they were about to embark on was going to have a profound impact on their lives. And very simply this morning, for the time that remains, I want us to consider the journey these disciples made and see what lessons the Lord has to apply to our hearts this morning. I want you to notice, first of all, with me then, the power of the storm. The shoreline was was now a distant memory as the disciples rowed their boat across the Sea of Galilee. The evening sun had now set and, and darkness was falling and it was yet another peaceful evening on the Sea of Galilee. As they were making their discussions of the day's events, I'm sure some of them took the time to recall a pastime and put the fishing rod over the side of the boat and try to catch some food for their supper when they reached the other end. This peaceful scene was was only interrupted briefly by a few birds that dove into the lake in an attempt to, to catch a few fish that had foolishly swam too close to the surface. And then suddenly... Without warning, the boat begins to rock from side to side. The wind begins to pick up, and before long, the disciples are thrown right into the midst of a terrible storm. Historians tell us that the Sea of Galilee is an unusual stretch of water. It's some 13 miles long and 7 miles wide. But it's about 150 feet deep, and most importantly, some shoreline is some 680 feet below sea level. And because of its unique location, it was susceptible to sudden storms. The winds which would have slept, swept over the land often came up and over and down the mountains, which then created downdrafts on the lake. And combining that with the thunderstorms that suddenly appeared, waves that were so calm and peaceful could suddenly turn into 20-foot violent waves. 
For those fishermen that were, see, were, for those disciples rather, that were fishermen previously, the beginning of this storm didn't cause them any anxious worry or concern. They didn't flinch at all. After all, they had been used to be on the sea of water. They had been used to the storm, albeit not at night. But I can't help but imagine that not all of the disciples were feeling like that. You remember Matthew. Matthew was a tax collector. And I just wonder, I just wonder, was Matthew a tax collector because he was afraid of the water? And the thought of going on a boat at any stage of the day or night terrified him. But now here he is, right in the midst of this most terrible of storms, and I'm sure he was sitting panicking. But whatever the reaction of all of the disciples, there was no doubt about it. They're now in the midst of the storm and we're given an indication as to how fierce it was because the word storm in the original has the meaning of a fierce tempest with driving wind and rain, a whirlwind, a hurricane. In other words, this was a most extraordinary storm. So they'd expected a smooth sailing. At the start of the journey, nothing had suggested otherwise, but... But now all has changed. And you know, as I thought of the journey that the disciples were making, it it reminded me so much of the Christian life that you and I are involved in. We're on the sea of life. And things should be going so smoothly, so calmly and so peacefully, and everything is wonderful, and all it takes is one phone call, one visit to the doctors, and our lives can be thrown into absolute turmoil and we're found right in the midst of an awful storm. And you know what's been said before, and it's worth saying again, that as believers, we're either in the midst of a storm, we're heading into one, or we're just perhaps coming out of one. And maybe there's someone here in our meeting this morning, an unknown to absolutely everyone else, that describes you. You're right in the midst of the biggest storm you've ever had to face in your life. And I trust that the word this morning will be an encouragement to you, especially. Minutes have passed, but it's felt like hours. The storm isn't improving, in fact. In fact, it's getting worse because we discover in the verse 37 that the waves were now beating into the side of the ship so that it was now full. I wonder, can you picture in your mind's eye these disciples, these seasoned fishermen? After being used to coping with storms of a small nature, they're now thrust into the most terrible storm they've ever had to face. And now they're discovering, you know what, I can't handle this. I don't know what to do. They suddenly became very afraid of the water. And they start to throw out all unnecessary cargo. They start to tie down the essentials. They roar with their oars as, be- oars as best as they could to get through the tumultuous waves. But all hope seemed lost. And you know, whether as a result of sorrow or suffering, family problems, work, school, university, whatever it is, we all have to deal with the storms of life. Sometimes the storms come to direct us. It's nearly as if sometimes God has to light the fuse under us to get us moving in the direction that he wants us to go to. And storms can direct us, but storms can also inspect us because it's been said, believe it or not, people are like tea bags. If you want to know what's inside them, just drop them into hot water. And you know, sometimes God tests our faith. Because we're told in James 1 and the verse 3, the trying of your faith worketh patience. So the storms can direct us, they can inspect us, but they also can correct us. And sometimes it's only through pain and failure, sometimes it's only when we've lost something we truly value that we understand the real meaning behind it. And we're told in Psalm 119, it was good for me that I have been afflicted that I might learn thy statutes. A storm can also be sent to protect us. That might seem like a strange thing. The story is told of a man who was fired from his job because he refused to do something that was unethical that his boss had asked him to do. Here he was, right in the middle of his own storm. No job, no money, no income, a family to support. 
But yet a year later it came in the news that the company that he used to work for, the management, had been convicted and sent to prison when their actions were finally discovered. God had meant it for good. So a storm can direct us, inspect us, correct us, protect us, but ultimately the storm is there to perfect us. Character building. See, God is more interested in our character than He is in our comfort. And we're reminded in Romans 5 that we glory in tribulations also, knowing what? That tribulation worketh patience, patience experience, and experience hope. But if we're honest this morning, there are many times when we go through the storms, and we've no idea why. We can't understand or comprehend why we've had to go through it. And some of us only months or maybe even years later that the true reason behind the storm comes out. John Newton, you'll be very familiar with, penned the words of the hymn, Amazing Grace. But he also penned the words of another hymn which describe a storm that he went through. And I want to take the time to read it to you this morning. This is what he said. I ask the Lord that I might grow in faith and love and every grace, might more of his salvation know and seek more earnestly his face. T'was he who taught me thus to pray, and he, I trust, has answered prayer, but it has been in such a way as almost drove me to despair. I hope that in some favored hour at once he'd answer my request, and by his love's constraining power subdue my sins and give me rest. Instead of this, He made me feel the hidden evils of my heart and let the angry powers of hell assault my soul in every part. Yea, with his own hand he seemed intent to aggravate my woe, crossed all the fair designs I'd schemed, cast out my feelings and led me, O Lord, why is this I trembling cried? Will thou pursue thy worm to death? Tis in this way the Lord replied, I answered prayer for grace and faith. These inward trials I employ from self and pride to set thee free and break thy schemes of earthly joy that thou mayst find and seek thy all in me. The disciples in the Sea of Galilee were now fully aware of the power of the storm. But I want you to notice secondly and quickly with me the problem in the storm. Because the violent nature of the storm has now left these seasoned, hardened fishermen in a position of not knowing what to do or where to turn. All their years of experience on the Sea of Galilee was of no use to them whatsoever. Now remember, they had explored every avenue. They'd cast out all excess cargo. They'd tied down the essentials. And I'm sure they were sitting thinking it's only a matter of moments And one more wave is going to capsize our boat for good and we are going to end up in a watery grave. But I think it's just then, it's just then the disciples realize the Savior is not there. They were so busy trying to sort out the storm and the problem that they hadn't discovered that the Savior wasn't with them discussing it. And I can just imagine one of the disciples has been sent to the back of the boat, find where Jesus is, go to him now. And he makes his way down to the back of the boat and he can hardly believe his eyes because there, lying in the back of the boat, is none other than Jesus and he's lying fast asleep on a pillow. I can imagine the disciple running back and telling the rest of them, you're not going to believe this. Look what we're facing. I've just found Jesus lying asleep in the back of the boat. And they all come rushing down to there and they find that there he is lying still asleep. And they come and they'll discover that they come to him in the verse 38. And they wake him and they shout at him and they say to him, Master, Master, carest thou not that we perish? See, these disciples momentarily forgot all about the storm. And they had all their anger and their frustration and their rage at the Lord. How could he? How could he possibly abandon us in our hour of need? How could he lie asleep on a pillow when we're facing almost certain death? And from the question that they pose to the Savior here, carest thou not that we perish, I believe it tells us that these men had a number of concerns. And I think the first concern was this, or sorry, the first number of doubts rather, they doubted the Lord's concern. Did you notice the question, Master, carest thou not? 
These disciples couldn't understand, they couldn't comprehend how the Savior could sleep when all around was chaos. They were convinced, absolutely, that the Lord didn't care about their situation. He seemed content to lie asleep and do nothing to help, and yet ours previously, he was so willing to help all around. Those that were sick, those that were blind, those, that man with the withered hand, he'd willingly touched and healed them all, and yet now in this situation, when they needed him most, he didn't seem to be concerned. You know, with the benefit of hindsight, we can just see how wrong these disciples were. I mean, like, how absurd was it that the boat would sink with the Son of God on board? And yet, this is what they were afraid of. But I think it would be fair to say that they just didn't think of the Son of God at that moment. Yes, they thought about the storm, the waves, the boat filling up with water, and the hopeless situation that they found themselves in. But the problem was this, they had left God out of the picture. You see, the heart that is full of unbelief looks only at the circumstances and leaves God entirely out of the picture. Faith, on the other hand, well, faith looks only at God and looks and leaves out the circumstances. Faith delights in God's extremity simply because it's God's opportunity. You see, if these disciples had only had the faith, they could easily have lain down in the back of the boat along with the Savior and slept, knowing all was well. But instead, their unbelief had made them uneasy and unable to rest. And they come to the Savior, Master, carest thou not? How could they ever have thought that the Savior didn't care? How could they ever have lost sight of his love to say nothing of his power? But in case we get too critical of of the disciples here this morning, let's, let's make it personal and let's be honest this morning. Isn't that so often our reaction to the Lord in times of trial and the storms that we face? When the winds are howling all around us, when the waves are crashing over the side of the boat, when we're facing the storm, and maybe there's someone here this morning, and that's you. You're in the middle of the storm, the waves are crashing over, and it feels at any moment one more wave will capsize your boat for good, and you're sitting thinking, you know what, the Lord doesn't care. The Lord's not concerned about me and the problem and the difficulty that I'm facing. Believer, if that's you this morning, can I encourage you? How can the one who gave his life for us, and we'll be remembering it shortly, who gave his life for us, who left his glory, who died on the cross and endured that shameful, agonizing, terrifying death to deliver us from eternal wrath, how could such a one ever fail to care for you and me? These disciples doubted the Lord's concern, but notice also they doubted the Lord's commitment. Because they say, Master, carest thou not that, what? That we perish. It seems as if these disciples have read the end of the book, they've decided the end of the story, and as far as they're concerned, we'd left our previous employment to follow the Lord, and now he's leading us into certain death. And maybe believe you're here this morning. And maybe that's how you feel. You feel like the Lord has abandoned you in the midst of your storm, in the midst of the problem, the difficulty that you're facing. Can I remind you of the words of Deuteronomy 31 and 8? And the Lord, He it is that what? He it is that doth go before thee. He will be with thee. He will not fail thee, neither forsake thee. Fear not, neither be dismayed. What wonderful encouragement to our hearts this morning that no matter what trial, difficulty we face, we have the Lord's assurance that He'll be with us every single step of the way. When we turn to Isaiah 49 and the verses 14 and 16, the question is posed, The Lord hath forsaken me, and the Lord has forgotten me. Can a woman forsake her sucking child that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? In other words, can a mother forget about her son or her daughter or or whatever is going on in their lives? And the answer comes back, yes, yes, they may forget, but I will not forget thee. And furthermore, 
Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Now I know in the age of technology, we all have our iPhones and our iPads and all these wonderful gadgets to help us remember events that are to take place. But some of you here will use the old-fashioned method. You'll take a pen and you'll write the telephone number, the address or whatever it is on your hand. And as you're going throughout the day, it will always be in front of you, always reminding you of what you need to do. And it's just the same in the verse, the Lord has our names engraved upon the palms of his hands. Therefore, believer, this morning, he can never, ever forget about you and me. They doubted the Lord's concern. They doubted the Lord's commitment. But notice also they doubted the Lord's comments to them. Do you remember what the Lord said to them at the start? What was he said to him in the verse 35? Let us pass over onto the other side. In other words, believer, the Lord had already told his disciples that they would make it to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. The difficulty was that they didn't take God at his word. If they hadn't been so full of fear, if they hadn't been so terrified of the storm, if they'd simply leaned on the Savior, then they would have known there was no need to be fearful or to be afraid, simply to trust His Word. Trust. Trust is one of those things as believers that should be the easiest thing for us to do. Now, I don't know about you, but I would be sure that there are some who will agree with this. Sometimes trusting the Lord can be the most difficult thing for a Christian to do. Because you're going through the storm and you can't understand, you can't comprehend why you're going through the difficulty and facing the trial and the circumstance that you're going through. And if only we could trust Him more simply, or as one author put it, he said this, we have little idea of how much we lose by not leaning more on the arm of Jesus day by day. We are so easily terrified. Every breath of wind, every wave, every cloud agitates and depresses us. Instead of calmly lying down and resting beside our Lord, we're, we're so full of terror and perplexity. Instead of using the storm as an occasion for trusting Him, we make it an occasion for doubting Him. And believer, how often is that not the case in our lives as believers? The story is told of a young military officer who got married many, many, many years ago. It was before the invention of planes, and so he took his bride on a large ship to cross over the ocean. And as they were making their way, a violent storm came and beat against her vessel. The young bride became very agitated, she wasn't used to being away from home and from her mom and dad, and she was terrified and scared of the storm. But strangely, as the storm got worse, she got more angry at her husband than she did at the storm. And the reason was that he wasn't afraid. She couldn't understand why her husband wasn't annoyed. You talk about trying to figure a woman out. And after a while, the husband got so agitated at his wife continually getting at him, that he took the sword that he had in his sheath, he pulled it out, and he pointed the tip of the sword at the throat of his new bride. She looked up at him and smiled. Can we work women out? No. And he said to her, you're not afraid? Oh, she said, no. She says, I'm not afraid of a sword when it's in the hands of the one who loves me. And then she got the point, but not literally. You don't have to be afraid of the storm, believer, when it's in the hands of the one who loves you. There's one who rules over land and sea. There's one who has the power to calm the storm that arises in your life. And believers, this morning, whatever we may face, we have no need to be fearful or afraid when our Heavenly Father is the one that is in absolute control. Now, I know our time is gone, but I feel it's important to continue. I want you to notice thirdly with me the purpose of the storm. Isn't that the obvious question? I mean, isn't that what you would ask as you're reading through the passage of Scripture? Why? Why did the disciples go through this storm? Why did the Lord allow them to go through it? Why was the Lord putting the storm in their way? And believer, don't we have similar questions too? Why? 
Why does this happen? Why does this storm come across our path? And believe me, I'm not qualified to answer why the storms may be in your life. But could I make some suggestions to you as to why the storm was necessary for these disciples to go through? You see, there were a number of lessons that these disciples, I believe, had to learn. And the only way they could learn them was to go through the storm. First of all, they learned about his power. The storm had terrified the disciples. There's no doubt about that. They were in fear and in trembling. They'd given up hope. They come to the Savior. They tell him about their problem. And the amazing thing is, the Savior wakes up. He stands to his feet and simply says, Peace be still. And the wind ceased. The waves calmed down. The storm was over. Despite all their shouting and fretting and worrying, the disciples had absolutely no hope of controlling their situation. Ah, but they were in the presence of the master of the universe and there was nothing that he could not do. And believe her, this morning, there might be someone here and you're going through a storm, but believe you me, God by his power can calm the wind with just a word if he so desires. But... In his design, in his divine sovereign will and sovereign grace, he may permit the storm to last. But I can tell you this, he will protect you in the storm. In Daniel 3, you'll remember the story. They were issued that they had to bow down to the statue. And anyone that failed to bow down to the statue would be cast into the fiery furnace. And the command is issued. And they all bow down, but as the king's looking across, he sees three men. Three men who refuse to obey the command from the king. And they're brought in before him, and they're questioned, and they're told that because of their refusal to obey the command, they were going to be thrown into the fiery furnace. And the response to the king in the verse 17 was what? If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from out of thine hand, O king. What a response! What faith to have! The king's angry, he's enraged, he orders that the fiery furnace is heated seven times hotter than before and the men are thrown back into it again. The king says in the verse 24, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form unto the fourth is like the Son of God. What more proof do we need? That if we are asked to endure the storm for a while longer, the Lord has promised that it'll be with us. They learned about his power, but they learned about his promises also. We've touched on this already. The Lord had promised he'd make it to the other side, but fear had got hold of them. And fear is contagious because it focuses on the problem rather than the God who is greater than the problem. And if only they had trusted and believed God, their fear would have been futile. God has promised that being fully persuaded that which he had promised, he was also able to perform. Thomas Watson once said, if our God be God, he will give us peace in trouble. When there is a storm without, he will make peace within. Oh yes, the world can create peace in trouble, or trouble in peace, but only God can create peace in trouble. But very quickly, they they learnt about his presence. That made all the difference. Remember at the start, I had mentioned that there were other little ships. What made the difference in this particular boat? The Saviour was with them. They were able to call upon him because he was with them. They were able to see him move in power because he was with them. They were able to experience his peace. Why? Because he was with them. And the Lord has told us in his word, my presence shall go with thee and I will give thee rest. But they also learnt about his purposes. You see, for these disciples, there was a reason why they were in the storm. As we've noted already, there were lessons that they couldn't learn anywhere else. Yes, it was okay for them to know about God's power, to know about His promises, to know about His presence when all was going well. He could see the effect on other lives. But it was only when they were put in the situation themselves that they realized that they had failed to grasp it. But finally, and ultimately, 
They learned about his peace. Isn't that what we're looking at this morning? Peace in the storm. The disciples had spent so much time worrying and fretting about their situation. What was the Lord doing? Well, we've discovered already he was fast asleep. And surely these disciples should have realized, well, if the Lord isn't worried, then why should we? Amy Carmichael put it like this, Thou art the Lord who slept upon the pillow. Thou art the Lord who soothed the furious sea. What matters beating wind and tossing billow? If only we are in the boat with thee, hold us quiet through the age-long minute. Whilst, while thou art silent and the wind is shrill, can the boat sink, dear Lord, when thou art in it? Can the heart faint that waiteth on thy will? With this I'll finish. Years ago, a farmer owned land across the Atlantic seacoast. He was always applying or asking for helpers to come, but no one was willing to risk leaving where they lived and moved to where he was because of the awful storms that developed. They wrecked havoc and buildings and crops continually, and finally, after many refusals, a short, thin man, well past middle age, approached the farm. Are you a good farm hand? The farmer asked him, and he said with his response, Well, well, I can sleep while the wind blows. Although puzzled by the response, the farmer had no alternative. No one else wanted the job, and so he hired him on the spot. And the man worked from dawn to dusk and the farmer couldn't complain and he was more than satisfied with all the work that he'd done. Then one night, the wind started to howl loudly in from the offshore. The farmer quickly jumped out of his bed. He ran into the room where his hired hand was sleeping and he shook him violently and he said to him, Get up, the storm is coming, get up. Let's go and tie the things down before they all blew away. With difficulty, he roused him. But the man turned over in his bed and he said, No, sir, I told you, I can sleep when the wind blows. The farmer was furious. He would have sacked him on the spot, but he realized the difficulty that he was in. And so he rushed out in order to prepare for the storm that was about to hit where he was. But to his absolute amazement, all the haystacks were covered with tarpaulins. The cows were safely in the barn, the doors were barred, the shutters were tightly secured, everything was tied down, nothing could blow away. The farmer then understood what his employee had meant, and he went back to his bed and slept the whole night through. You see, believers, this morning, we can secure ourselves against the storms in life by grounding ourselves in the Word of God. And as a result, we can have peace in the storm. See, believers, we don't need to understand. We just need to hold his hand to have peace in the storm. May God bless